Zone. How's it going, everybody? Wherever you're listening to this episode right here, this is episode 79 of the Temper Zone podcast, which hosts me, Amir Max, and that's all facts. My special guest in the building today, in the Zoom today, is somebody um, that is very, very nice on the mic, y'all. Can do a lot of different things on it. He can sing as well, hits you with that deep shit as well. And on top of that, he hosts events on his IG you know, getting all the artists on. So it's really dope, man, spreading the word. I got Shoddy in the building with me, man. How's it going, bro? I'm doing well, King. How you living tonight, man? Shoot, man, I'm good, you know. Just just another day, you know. Blessed to see another day, you know. That's how I be seeing it with all this shit going on, so. Yo, ain't that the truth, man. Amen. <laughs> it's crazy out here, man, you know what I'm saying? How have you been uh, staying afloat during all this, man? I mean, I see you, you know, grinding and doing your thing, but how have you been trying to just keep up and trying to stay Yo. afloat? You know, I, you know, the fortunate thing is, is, you know, the politics gives us so much comedy. I haven't had to look at any standups lately. So that's what keeps me entertained. Um, for sure. For real, man. I was, I was laughing so much at that. This is better than, this is better than a standup special. Only thing better than this is if you gave me a Christmas Netflix special with Chris Rock or like Eddie Murphy or something. I don't know how much better than that shit. I was sitting there like, this is amazing. So between watching politics, between getting Minority News kind of up and running and working on the next season of that, um, and then kind of uh, just finishing up the production side of the album and getting it out to people, and then now working on what we got coming up for it. So, um, And then hosting events, you know, um, we'll get into that a little bit more, but just trying to do a little bit of everything. I kind of get myself out of a lot of stuff when I'm in album mode just so I can focus and, like, really get in on it. And then after that, I'm always like, yo, let me do this. Let me see who I can get. Let me see who I can get. Because I'm always looking and seeing who's working as well, too. So, like, as, as I'm working, I see others working. So I try, when I know their stuff is released, try to make sure we do something together at a certain time to make mm-hmm. it so that we all have cohesively, you know, share a good market of people understanding we got great music out here, you know? Yeah, you know, definitely. And it's, it's good, you know, use whatever platform that you got to make that work. And that's all, it's all the difference. And I think with what you're doing with the platform that you got, man, I really think it's, you know, it's working, man. I, I, you know, it's just, it's growing, it's growing. People are more, you know, tuning into it. And that's definitely what you want to see, man. Yeah. But, Thanks um, for, hey, man, it's, it's what, it's what's the work. Even, you know, that with the, with the podcast, I'm sure like the first 20 episodes where you're like, yo, I'm putting these out as niggas even watching these things. And then now, yeah, an episode away from 80. You know what I mean? First of all, that's an incredible accomplishment in itself because a lot of people it's don't crazy, even man. make it to 10 episodes on a, on a regular series show on ABC. Yeah. You got to 80. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's it's crazy, crazy. man. It's there's, crazy. There's, there's actors that get paid more than we do that don't even get it that much air time. So mm-hmm. respect. But you know what I mean? It's all about how you work Thank and what you're doing together with it. Yeah, man, I never looked at it that way with the TV shows, but like, yeah, you're right. 80, almost 80 is pretty crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> Yo, that's almost like what Charlie Sheen got for that anger management shit on FX and that nigga didn't even go through five seasons. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Holy what? Bro, talk about a runaway. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I remember that, man. Oh, shoot. And Charlie Sheen, before he really lost his mind, but. That's the guy <laughs> like fully feeling his veins. Yeah, man. He really lost his shit, bro. But let's not digress too much on Charlie Sheen. Um, <laughs> I want to <laughs> ask you, man, just like, you know, you got so much going on and I can obviously tell you got a lot of experience, but obviously it started from somewhere. So how did you yeah. get involved with doing music and just getting into just the industry like this? Uh, so I knew what I wanted to do when I was 19 in college. So I changed my major halfway through school and I started doing oh, wow. film writing and screenwriting and allowing me to do that allowed me to get into the studio. And so I would get into the studio class and I swear I filled up so much of that fucking time and did a lot of, <laughs> stuff. but I didn't release anything for the longest time. I mean, I was a lot of SoundCloud stuff, a lot of stuff here and there, just trying to see what's up or whatever. Um, but I took the long road. I think the one thing that like I really appreciate about it now, I did not appreciate it, not one damn bit at all starting, um, was that I took the long road. Like I knew at 19, like this was going to be a long ass process to get any recognition, to get any respect, to get a name, to get whatever, even from your hometown, let alone the fucking world. Yeah. So I knew, you know, at 19, like what I was going to put out on SoundCloud and shit was nothing that I should go and try to figure out, yo, how do I put out a, le- a record on like iTunes or like Spotify or something? You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't look at it that way for the first couple of years. I looked at it as like, yo, I'm going to rack up as much time as I can working in the booth as much as I can. And then when I graduated in 2015, I 
took all of my life savings and traveled through L.A., Florida, Georgia, uh, Alabama, Tennessee. I traveled all around the world where music was either a very big part of it or an assistant part of it because I had friends or family that lived there so I could crash on the couch or whatever. And that whole summer, I just worked and just saw a lot of different things, tried to get on some open mics, saw some, got some advice from different places, different scenes. So when I came back and I started working, I was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. Now, the reason why I came mm-hmm. back wasn't even my own personal reason to come yeah. back. I was planning on living in Atlanta. So like I moved to Atlanta. I got with my uncle. My uncle's gonna let me stay there. You're rent like, it's, it's hella lit. Let me stay. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah, it was like Atlanta the first year. I get to stay there rent free. And then he's like, if I don't figure out something within the first year, we gotta figure something out. So I'm like, okay, yeah. bet. But like a month into it, my pops tell, calls me. He's telling me he's sick. Now we didn't end on good terms. So I dropped everything I was doing in Atlanta and I came back home to help him. And so at the time, I was like, yo, I didn't mean to come back home this early, but at the same time, I got to come home. So getting into it a little bit quicker than I wanted to um, yeah. when I first got back. But then it was kind of like it became not only just my dream and my livelihood, but it became the thing that kept me alive because of all the stuff that I had going on. And like the realization of like somebody that was like your hero getting sick and deteriorating and realizing like there's a limited amount of time. So. I did a lot of work learning a lot of different jobs growing up. I'm a pastor's kid. So he was a pastor. So I was the, one of those original pastor's kids where they're like, they had everything in the church. I was the, I was the opener, the closer, the cleaner, the usher, the deacon boy. (laughs) You tell that joke. They talk about me. I I was that kid. They talk about me, the lights, the cleaner, the director, the the fucking, the the DVD player, the audio, Mm -hmm. Everything. So I knew how to do all of the business stuff from a kid. I just didn't realize at the time, obviously five years ago, how I would apply it. So over time, it kind of became like, all right, well, I like putting shows together. I like being on shows. I'm tired of paying 300 fucking bucks to be on a show. Why don't I just pay the fucking rent to get the building and get my other friends and we'll do the show and I won't pay them half and they won't have to do half as much. Mm-hmm. And I know every time I do that, I know a lot of people will do like 300 and stuff like that to cover the expense. I'm not trying to cover the expense. I'm trying to get them out there to their fans so they can see them perform so they can do music. Like if I can make it enough just to cut even, then I'll live because Mm -hmm. it's really not about at this moment in time, like making a crazy profit. It's about getting the music out there and letting you know, Hey man, Oh, he fuck with me. You know what I mean? Like, so the next show you go to, it's like, I don't know why the fuck am I paying $500. Like I just paid like 150 to like literally perform in the same place. Like what the fuck just happened? Yeah. But with my way of getting artists to make them think like, should I have to pay this much? Is it really like that? Or could I do it my own way? You know what I mean? Cause I don't, I'm not the one to tell another man how to live his life or how to direct his own path. No, no, no. I am going to show you in within questions. Sometimes we're like, Hmm, well, that's all right. My nigga only charged me two, but this nigga's charging me five. There's a $300 gap here somewhere. Mm-hmm. What's going on? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like, after a while, they figure it out for themselves. It's not like I have to sit there and be like, yo, my nigga, here's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. If they're doing, get the fuck with me. I don't even go at that route. I'm just like, yo, here's my price. If they say something, great. That's on you. I'm exactly. not going to talk about finances with another man. That's your business. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, um, so I got into that. And then the first album came about in 2019. So I started this shit in 2013. I didn't drop the first album until 2019. Yeah, because I was checking your, like, Spotify. And, like, I, I, I noticed, like, it wasn't that. I also I was, you know, I had, like, a bunch of songs on there because I was just, you know, from what I was hearing, I was like, man, like, you sound like you probably has, like, a bunch of albums out. Let me see. And then I was like, I didn't see that as much as I thought. I was like, wow. Like, I was like, he probably has some stuff in the tuck that is, like, from on other websites. Oh, and man, stuff I, like got, that. I got so much in the vault. <laughs> I, I, like, even now, like I'm working on a group project with another local artist. I won't give it away because he's gonna get mad at me if I do. But yeah, we'll keep it like, on the low for now. Yeah, we're working on like I'm working on a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And the thing is, is like I always call it the Trinity. I complete the Trinity, right? You're gonna laugh when I tell you this, but it's true. All right, so you had your neighborhood friendly ghost Casper, uh-huh. you had your neighborhood friendly Spider Man, Spider Man, mm-hmm. and then you had your neighborhood friendly Black Man, Shotty. I complete the trifecta. So. <laughs> You know, I complete the traffic. <laughs> it's all that. Um, but it, you know, in a way, it was like I knew I was a personable person. I knew that I love to be around people. I always want to hang out, make new friends, and stuff like that. But also with this business, sometimes too, like it's important to just let people know that you care about them and you rock with them. You know what I mean? Like Chuan Nine K and me and Sleezus and you know Terry Borderline. We've been rocking for a little bit now. You know, most uh, the most generous Kashi two time. I, I know those guys for a long time now. So you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So. 
whenever I get a show or something like that or get ready to do it, I'm always having them in mind. And the thing was, it's just, you know, studying and researching and being in those other atmosphere and those other markets, man, you realize a lot of people come together as groups. And then whenever somebody gets their deal or whatever, okay, fine, do your deal. But hey, bro, give me on a record for here and let me get some royalties on it so that way I can make some money. Like they look at it a lot more long-term investment. How we look at it here is like, it's a one-time transaction fee. And so mm. like one of the things that I appreciate about rolling with these guys over the years is, is we kind of built that rapport. So it's like now, like, it's like, yo, man, I need you on this track. It's not even a question about fees and shit like that. It's just like, all right, here's the royalty numbers that you're going to get. You feel what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. to me, that's more important. Whereas up here, we're taught like, yo, get your bread from that nigga. Because if it blow and you don't have anything on the record, then at least you came out with something. But what if you had the royalties and it did blow and you two yeah. marketed it together and it worked and it worked for both, both of y'all benefit and y'all both got a cut. We're always looking out for numero uno. And when I got out of here, it really taught me like, yo, learn how to like spread it around, but also realize like you need pieces to the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Like every person has a puzzle. You know what I mean? Every, every brand is a puzzle. I should say not people. Every brand is a puzzle. Yeah. And we're not just that whole one puzzle cannot just be us as a piece, meaning that there are other things that you need to complete this painting piece. And so one of the things that I love with um, just doing that, was it took me time, but I got to know so many people like them. Yeah, man. Like, I didn't do a lot of records for a lot of years, but I did record a lot. Mm-hmm. And so when I record, I got to meet certain people. When I got to certain events, I would meet people. And my whole thing was, was when I come out, you going to know who the fuck I am and how I move. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my whole thing. So I was, like, very patient and adamant about it. And so Welcome to Dopeland started in 2017. It took two and a half years, three years to finish the album. Damn. So I went through so many different iterations of it because I was like, it's my first thing out the gate. It's my first time out. I want to do this right. I want to do it this way. Oh, but, I think, but I think the other big thing that I, I took to it too was, and I, sh- and I wish I would have known, I was so eager to put it out that I didn't take into consideration the rollout process like I did with 27 Club. Yeah. You know what I mean, I, I was just eager. I was young. And I think I was just at a point in my life, in my own mental clock, that it was like, yo, nigga, you've been doing this for quite some time. You got to put some shit out so people can fucking hear it saying, so you can mm-hmm. prove a fucking point. You know what I mean? It's like you, as an artist, when you get close to like getting something done, you and I both know you're always like, right before you send it off, you're like, could I add something else to it? Yeah. What else needs to be done? Like, like this else, can't like, be, this can't be else? perfect. Yeah. Exactly. Like, you know I mean? <laughs> like, and you know the type of the artists that do that when you hear their music, because you can mm-hmm. tell they took this sweet ass time mm-hmm. to give you something that you're like, yo, I like. Mm-hmm. Something that's like, cohesive, something that like you can feel the meaning. Somewhere it's like, I, damn, like he, 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 it sounded like that. That one bar had five years of experience in it. You know what I mean? Like shit, yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. for real. You know what I mean? But that that's the that's the stuff that I enjoy. And so I think that's why it took so long for Dope to come out. And then there was just so much iteration that had gone on because I had planned to drop it in June of 2018. But that's mm-hmm. when he passed away. So then I had to take that whole year, kind of uh, regroup, get stuff together. And then the following year, on the same date, I dropped the project. That's why I think it's so significant. Because it was like, I was planning to do it that Father's Day the year before as a gift to be like, yo, man, like, we were butting heads for years. Mm-hmm. Man, he's a pastor. He's a, he's a black pastor. Like, this is not what you expect their sons to be doing. You know what nah. I mean? Like, oh, I want to go do multimedia and do my own empire thing. It's like, you should be working on the word. No, 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 no. To, I really believe you got something and one day you're going to win a grade. You know what I mean? For me, for yeah. me to hear that after years and fighting and arguing and not talking to each other and being in the same house and with everything that went on, it was like, for me, it was like, I got to do this. And not only that, every time I wake up in the morning, I got to eat like I ain't got nothing to eat. Even if my fridge is full, I got to act like I got nothing to eat. So it was just like, it was a real hard reminder that year, but it was also like, you got to make sure this counts. And then Dope Land came out. And I remember when Dope Land came out, I was so happy. I finally got some like something out there for people to have on all streaming platforms. And I remember that night, I, well, I listened to it when it came out at midnight. I listened to it one time. I was with my best friend at my old house, sat down, took a sip, went back to my notebook and started writing 27 Club. He was like, yo, what the hell? Damn. <laughs> you went right back to it, man. I was like, I'm not satisfied. I was like, this is good, but I know I got more. I know I got something better coming. And I think that's the coolest thing about taking the year and time that I have between the two to really embrace myself. Because I feel like Welcome to Dope Land was like, yo, I want to make a rap album so people yeah. know like I'm a good rapper. This album, I wanted you to know me as a person. 
like all the facets, all the mm-hmm. flaws. All, I wanted to be completely vulnerable because I felt like we needed that. Definitely, man. I really think with 27 Club, man, like, you know, there's so many layers to it. And like, I could truly tell, like, you were trying to show off your versatility, not only with the fact that, oh, I can rap and sing, because that's just the, that's, that's how it goes now. Like rappers sing, someone who can rap yeah, and sing, you, you can't, that's you can't a thing. be in the industry without doing both now. Yeah, but like with you, you're rapping different on certain songs. Like you're singing different on certain songs. I'm like, okay, like he, he be getting in different pockets and different stuff like that. So like, it makes me want to, I wonder, man, like who were some of your inspirations growing up? Like, did you just, did you take, I mean, I know like, you know, growing up in the church, like you must've, that must've helped a lot, but what else has, uh, inspired you? My two biggest influences growing up weren't anywhere near East coast rappers. Hmm. It's Andre 3000 and Ludacris. Okay. I can they see were the like, yeah. they, they, they <laughs> like, they were, they were everything to me. Cause like, here I am, like, not only because to me, it was always the long game. You know what I mean? Like they were not only rapping, they were singing or they not singing. Like if Andre wasn't rapping, he was singing. If fucking Luda wasn't rapping, he was acting. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing him. But yeah. that <laughs> made the buzz so fucking mm-hmm. hot. It was like, I can go to the movies and see Luda. I can go to my car and hear Luda. Like, and, and on top of that, those are both like extremely respectable rappers. Like, yeah, no one's like, ever oh, questioned those fire. guys' as pens. You know? Exactly. But you know what? The other big thing is too is you never really hear them in the arguments that we have a lot. Like all oh, like top tens, top yeah, yeah, like all the barbershop ones you hear. But I guarantee you right yeah. now. If I put on Red Light District right now, some niggas would be like, oh, shit. So crazy, yeah. I mean, or if I play AT Aliens, somebody going to be like, oh, shit, or Sex Future, or hey, yeah, someone's mm-hmm. going to go and start screaming, whether you the biggest thug in the world or you the tiniest woman that's the <laughs> most anky. You're going to sing, hey, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's just so, contagious. <laughs> or big as far as artistry, because I wanted to make sure that I had so much versatility in all different assets and ways. I think for artistry with business, it was always Jay-Z. And I studied Drake to the letter. Yeah. Like, to the letter. Because I because him, because for me, it was such a unique time for me growing up. Because I grew up in the rise of Big Sean, J. Cole, Drake. Ken, yeah, man. You know, Joey Badass. So I'm sitting here, like, watching 1999 and fucking section 80 and all this shit. And I'm seeing this kind of categoric rise, like strategic, like kind of mm-hmm. through. And then the whole game changes. Yeah. And it changes on it. So it's like all of us that are coming up, we're like, that's the way we get on the college tour. We do this, we do that. And then the internet hits and everybody's like, Oh shit. Mm-hmm. And then now we find out we can run our own shit and control our own shit. And so, the yeah, thing social that, media you know, shook everything up, man. It did, but what it taught me was with him, he was always ahead of the curve, right? So nowadays on a regular basis, memes are part of our lives. They're not a roast to somebody, and if they are, it's funny because you can find somewhere else to find this meme page to do this again, mm-hmm. right? Back then, you remember when he had, like, the owl thing, but he had, like, the Houston Astros shit that was, like, hella long, and he looked like this? Walking yeah. <laughs> That was a meme before a meme, but the nigga was everywhere for the next two weeks. Mm-hmm. It got you, you know what I mean? And the other thing is he was so, so versatile. And then with Jay, it was always rap is here, music is here. How can I expound on that? And so creating title and so creating like what he's doing now with a college in New York, like creating a, a sector to learn how to do business, to learn how to make sure you know your management and learn your skills and learn your training. Those are the things that, like, as far as business artist wise, because not only were they the top of their game, they were top of their business as well. Mm-hmm. So it's like, not only are you going to love every album they got, you're going to love all the merch they drop. You're going to like their clothing line. You're going to like what they do with their movies, yeah. whether they take property or this nigga fucking Drake going and doing a fucking uh, Ice Age movie as a fucking tusk. You don't care. You're going to spend the $25 so your daughter can hear this nigga's voice. You mm-hmm. know what I mean, they're always somewhere where the revenue was coming from. So, Luda and Andre for a creative aspect. And then the overall person that I would say that is like my biggest inspiration who I strive to be um, kind of like in his lane or kind of like respect his lane is Childish Gambino. I, I, feel I, that, I, saw, man. Saw, mm-hmm. I saw that the whole time. I mean, from 2011, when I saw him at Brandeis University, when he took himself on tour, because a lot of people don't know that year, he was done with the first season of Community. He took himself on tour throughout the year, throughout the season, throughout the um throughout the uh, the country. Yeah. All these free places. 
just took himself, put it on. He was like, yo, I'll pay for it. Just mm-hmm. make it a free concert. I'll bring the stage. I'll, I'll do all of that. Just give me the space. Yeah, How much is it going to take to do that? I remember and, that, yeah. You know what I mean? To see that and then to go to the garden a couple of years ago when he was coming out right before the last album dropped with This Is America and to see the whole place sold out and to see what it was, it was like for me, not only mm-hmm. was it like I had like experienced my own journey, but it was like, yo, this is possible. This mm-hmm. is real. To so start on a college campus where nobody's like, eh, I don't know. And I didn't ever know who he was. And he became like, for me that day yeah. to now seeing everybody in the world look at him the way I do in this building it was like nuts but it was also like such a recharged feel of like yo you can do this like this is possible yeah. you know whenever I see stuff like that I have so many friends that are like yo got a lot of work to do one day and I'm like nah man this is, and when I see it I'm like this is possible <laughs> it's possible it's crazy there's a lot of work I gotta do I'm gonna have a lot more sleepless years I don't give a fuck, but this is right. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, man. No, nah, definitely. And I feel like, like, Charles Gambino is just one of those guys that, like, it showed, like, I put him in my personal top five, like, favorite. Like, yeah. Oh, like, okay. So it's, it's funny you mentioned him as, like, one of your favorite. I mean, um, like, because the internet is an album, I put it up in my personal top five favorite albums. Like, so Gambino's a guy, like, yo, like, you saying that, thumbs up, man. I think me and you have a very similar music taste. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like, like, yo, when, like, how everybody looks at, like, like Drake is like that guy. I'm like, that's how I look at Gambino. Like how everybody's like, Drake said Drake. I'm yeah. like, yo, this guy here. Cause it's like, yo, you can't, you're still waiting on his, his series, his TV series. Mm-hmm. He made you wait a year and a half for an album after he dropped the hottest record in the world mm-hmm. a year before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, he's got Crazy. you waiting on bated breath, but it's worth it every time. Yeah, every time, man. And yeah. you're like, damn it, now I've got to wait again another three years. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Or like another whatever, but it's like, He's it's got always you. content that's just like, damn, even if I'm sitting at it now when it just came out, a couple months after it came out, a little bit after it came out, a couple years after it came out, I can still be like, damn, man, like this is relevant. Like this is fire. Mm-hmm. No, I feel you, man. I feel you. Like, I think Gambino showed like that, like, you can do whatever you want. Like, and if your rap, if your music's tight, you can kind of just branch off however you want from there. Exactly. Like, if you really got it like that, if you really can do that, like word, make it happen. Cause rap is the, the shit it's the zeitgeist. It's the thing right now. So if you are able to like dominate that field, do that field well, then you can kind of branch off, but let's not pretend that like there's people out here who, try to do the comedy thing and then they're really just trying to be a rapper in disguise. You know yeah. what I mean? No, and no one takes that. their rapping seriously. Like, so there's those people out there still, but Gambino sure. was the one that showed like, if you really got that talent, like if you really can do it, yeah. you can make it happen. Cause but I think the other thing too, that we learned over time was, was that he was a well round, well rounded actor. Exactly. Mm hmm. Like, I think a lot of us, like, I mean, even he had to break the curb of being corny. So, like, it's this, it happens to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, he never talks about it, but I think that's one of the reasons why he left community was like, yo, like, I need to break out of this stigma of this because if I'm trying to do these other things, I need to get out of this. I think he loved it so much. um, But at the same time, it was like one of those things where, which taught me is like, if you feel it's time for you to move on from something, you got to move on from it. And yeah. I, I love community. Like it's my, one of my favorite shows in the world. Mm-hmm. And so like, I hate watching it after season five. Cause it was like, well, what's the effing point? I mean, there's no real point now that there's no Troy. Yeah. But right. <laughs> realize just how good his acting was mm-hmm. when you're like, yo, the show ain't the same without one guy. And there's five main characters. Mind you all, everybody in that show went on to go do positive shit in their careers. Very and, true. Like, break off so it wasn't like it was a cast that like he he held on to them and carried them nah. like they all carried their own shit it was just mm-hmm. he was that impactful in the show and that impactful in life at the time that made mad people stop watching the show after he left yeah it's crazy man <laughs> yeah it's wild but that's why that's like oh uh, to kind of wrap up that like whenever he takes his sweet time with something and he delivers on the product you're like damn i love this product and you're ready for the next thing yeah, man. Now Gambino's a, a prime example of that, man. Um, if if y'all if, if this wasn't a co-sign to check out Gambino and Luda and three stacks, if y'all, <laughs> yeah, for real. y'all better check them out, man. Those are just three artists that are really just a shit, man. You know, it's just not even a yeah, question. So top of the line, shit. Yeah, it really is, man. You know, it really uh, is, you know. Um, but yeah, I want to ask you about the uh, 
27 Club. Let's get back to that, man. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just ask you, like, what was the meaning behind that title choice? Because obviously, 27 Club, you know, first thing I'm thinking when I hear that, you know, is people who had died at the age of 27, like yeah. Kurt Cobain, Jimmy yeah. Hendrix, Janis Joplin. Yeah. So why did you name the album 27 Club? Where, where, where did that root from? Okay, so I remember telling you I started working on this album last June. Mm-hmm. But the album really didn't take shape until probably November of last year. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was sitting with myself and I'm like, yo, I'm happy with what I was doing. I was making a lot of records. I was getting ready to work on a whole nother project that wasn't called this. Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting by myself one night and I just was listening to an interview, an old interview. And not with me. It was with J. Cole before with Angie Martinez on the 20, right, before, right with the 2014 Forest Hills Drive Drop. Okay, yeah, yeah, that was a very like legendary interview. Yep. Yeah, and I just kind of like it kind of stumbled upon it because like I'm sitting outside smoking, end of the day, listening to a podcast, you know, just chilling on my porch, not thinking anything of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And long story short, it, it kind of hit me. And it was like, yo, like I want to make something that like whether good, bad, or indifferent, I can live with it because I know like I was at peace with myself and I was vulnerable. And I try to give people something to make themselves feel better by talking about me being broken. And so mm -hmm. that night I wrote own worst enemy that night in November. And that's kind of where the formation of it became because I wanted to talk about it because there was a lot of things I didn't deal with. Like I tried to commit suicide in college. I don't Damn. share that a lot. I don't, I don't deal with it, but that's what own worst enemy. That's what that story is. Yeah. Own worst enemy is that night. I mean, it was years ago in college, but I, wrote that story because I was like, this is what I want this album to be. I want this album to be all sides of me from the wild start of for the gram to the more hopeful ending of where I am in my life now with optimism and faith and like stay up. Like it may be crazy, but you can stay up because you're close. You're close. You got it. You're close. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. with own worst enemy, it really started that change, not only with my music, but with my life to be like, yo, you know what? Now I want to make an impact while I'm here. I want to make, a good chance of things while I'm here and to wrap up a lot of closure, like this album wraps up a lot of things for me. Um, so like, yeah, it ends very motivational, man. I was, yeah. gonna, you know, I got a very, very motivational ending at it, but yeah. Thank you. And that, that was the hope and prayer out of it. That, I, I didn't know how people were going to take it, but that was my hope. Oh yeah, for sure. And after I, you know, after I've listened to the album, I definitely felt that like closure for sure, for certain, man. So definitely. Yeah. And so I, one of the things with this album, like a lot of things I talk about closing, like, you know, Cuffing season is about me closing the chapter on my first love from college because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, guys, we talk about missing a girl, but we don't talk about like the emotional aspect of it because a lot of us, nah, man, <laughs> and, and especially for us as men, right? We don't talk about how like we're so shy about it. <laughs> we're terrible, not even shy. We're terrible. No, terrible. <laughs> it's like, yo, man, she left. Yeah, nigga. So the game is on at nine tonight. It just yeah, and, it's like yo, you ain't sad or nothing. No, it's like not. We're not even like trying to like deal with it. And so one of the things that I had learned from, and I took, and one of the things that I, I want to stress with, and I'm, one of the things I'm working on right now is working on with mental, um, you know, companies and stuff like that now to talk about mental health awareness and things like that is because I do talk about a lot of that in here. Um, and with, um, with cuffing season, it was the male tox, tox, men, toxicity of it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We always are talking about how like, we need to be this, we need to be that. But it's like, in reality, I, I miss this person. And emotionally wise, I had never left 22. I had grown up and been 27 in a lot of areas, but emotionally with, mm -hmm. within a relationship and with a woman, I was still 22. So Damn. it was like, I need to get rid of this, mm -hmm. and get the rest of this person to the rest of wherever it else is. And so what Omar sent me, it gave me the, the concept of the album. It was like, what if you were somebody that thought about it, but it didn't happen? and you got left, what was your purpose being left? Mm -hmm. And so I felt that night in November writing that record that my purpose kind of came to me that night. Like I knew music and, and speaking and stuff was it, but then the purpose of doing it with vulnerability, talking about how we need to be open as men, talking about topics that we're afraid to talk about, but give them like interesting hooks and catchy verses, mm -hmm. and songs. That's when I realized like, that's where I want my career to go going forward. Like, I know it'll sell itself over time, but like numbers don't matter to me anymore. Getting everybody yeah. attention shit don't matter. Like what the, the message was, was like as a black person in America, as a human in America, 
We all are struggling with depression. We're struggling with wanting to fuck, with wanting to have somebody on a regular basis, with suicidal thoughts, with wanting somebody to just be there with them, with the rage of King Kong, with the full, you know, the full spectrum, man, that full like, spectrum. I'm not crazy. Like, I just wanted people in America to know, like, it's not crazy to feel this way because I feel the same exact way. Yeah. How I got to the end of it. Mm hmm. Well, I really can tell, man, with you that you have you have a lot of self awareness. You know what I mean, and so I think that is probably one of your strongest attributes because you are able to tackle a lot of these big topics that a lot of artists could you know wish that they could, and a lot of artists who just say hell no, I I'm staying the hell away from these topics. Y'all ain't gonna get none of that stuff, you know, stuff, you know, stories out of me. So I gotta commend you for for you know putting it out there, you know, cause you know, that type of vulnerability is something to definitely, you know, salute to man. Cause you know, spreading these stories out, you know, you know, you say, you know, you could save a life and you know, that one life is that's, it's that's all. That, I need. It's that's all, all I need. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, that's such a good feeling, you know, when, when someone lets you know that, you know, what you're doing is actually making a positive impact, man. I think, you know, especially in this time in 2020 with mental health being such a big deal and such a big thing, you know, it's so important that the people who have really been through these things speak up because it's unfortunate that there are people out here who are trying to capitalize on mental health when they have had gone through nothing, mm-hmm. but for me, someone who takes it seriously, I can tell when someone's being for real, when someone's being genuine about it. And so I really think, you know, more things like that is just what we need out here, man. Because like you said, with, you know, toxic masculinity, bro, like, yeah. man, we got it bad, yo. Like, like oh. I don't even want to have to talk about women. Like, we have to yeah, talk like, about uh, men right now, bro. Like, like this is <laughs> like when it comes to this mental health shit, we, can't, we have to like break it up, you know? Yeah. Like starting with black men and then men in general, like it's, it's, it's complicated. And I, and I, I just wanted to say that because, you know, this shit is complicated. And so when it comes to mental health, I, I advise people just to, just to do your due diligence and understand that it is real and to, and to look into it and everything in it. And I'm one of those people who like, they asked me to get into it for years and I, and I can attest and I can even elaborate more on what you're exactly saying. Mm-hmm. I was one of those kids for years that they told me to go and I didn't. I didn't know that I had mental, I didn't know I had mental, I had to take medication. I did not know that until I started going to therapy, until I started going to stuff later on after college. So I didn't know after the fact, but how many black American boys or American males are in this country that probably need to see that or need to go do that, that don't do that. And by the time they do it, it's 30 or 40. And there's so much other stuff piled up on top of the things that they couldn't deal with at 22. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it was kind of just like, Wow. You know, and I think one of the big things, like it took so long for me to get to that point because it took so long for me to constantly faithfully stay in therapy. Mm-hmm. It was like, it, it, like I didn't want to get into it because I was just like, oh, no, fuck that. I don't need yeah. that. Shit. I'm a rapper. I can write it. And even then, and one of the things that blew my mind and I can, I want to stress definitely. it for anybody who thinks it's not going to help their music or their writing. Oh, it opens a whole nother book. Yes, it, it does, opens, man. It opens a whole nother world, especially <laughs> yeah, when, you, man. When, when you can speak on your own shit in vivid detail. That's when you're like, <laughs> you just open up a whole different ball like, game. Ah, you know what I mean? Like, and, 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 I, you know, my, my therapist, she was awesome. And she kind of gave me this idea of like, don't look at it as a hindrance. Look at it as your extra superpower for what you're trying to do. Yeah, man. That's why, that's why that's how I try to look at it too, man. Like this mental health stuff, you have to, you know, you know, like to quote Kanye West, you know, you know they want to call it a disability. It's a superpower. I'm a superhero. You know, he says that like on, uh, yeah. on uh, the Ye album. And it's like, I know Ye's a, you know, a crazy guy. And I like, but like, I know he has some sense too, but like, you know, that off of there just lets me know. And like other people out there, if you're going through anything, like use that as not your crutch, but as your assistance, you know, as your, as that thing that makes you, you know, the individual you are, you know what I mean? Because yeah. Especially for artists, right? When I finally kind of like got to a safe and a comfortable place in my own life, right? It was like, that's what they want us to be anyways. We mm-hmm. ha- They want us to be ourselves, but the problem is, is we get so many outside voices and stuff like that that you don't get a chance to just listen to you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the best things that I learned with this album because the first album... I wanted a lot of fan feedback because I wanted them to bump it. I wanted people to know, like, you know, to get the word out and know that the album was coming. Of course. But this time around, it was like, I, I know how to make these records. I know how to do this. And this time I'm going to do it my way. And so I'm so happy for 
relief of myself because I was so fucking nervous to release it. Because I was just like, are they going to like it? Are they going to be like, oh my God, this thing is fucked up. I was like, what the fuck is going Like, my head was swimming like eight ways to Sunday before this shit dropped. I'm like, are people going to like, I'm I relate too hard to that shit, bro. <laughs> Mine. And so, but you know, to hear everybody's reactions and for a lot of people to come to me and for them to be like, your own worst enemy it hit me, man. It made me think about some things. It made me want to go and check on my own shit. And like, for me, that made me almost hit tears. Cause I was like, that's yes, the- yes, yes. Yeah. That's, that's the, the shit you drink to. <laughs> that's, that's the shit I wanted because I wanted yeah. you. I just like what we've had nothing but destruction this year. If anything, this album I wanted to do was just to heal and get, get you ready to move on. Right. There's yeah. Coming. There's another season coming. And that's the worst. And that's the worst thing. I think we all feel like we all like, hate sometimes I have to realize too mm-hmm. is this ain't going to last forever and I think a lot of times because we get stuck in it for months and months on end time like that I think working on this album really kept me in that spirit of like yo you gotta stay committed you for gotta sure. stay courage you gotta stay hopeful and you gotta keep working because you know and we can just go back to the 50s in Kansas City Missouri Black Wall Street in those Midwestern areas mm-hmm. they didn't have the support of all these major banks they didn't have no. the support of a lot of these things they're doing. So what did they do? They work day and night, and they would even have to go and find other black-owned businesses to cover so when they had to make the extra tax back, it came back to them. Mm-hmm. They found a way to get it done. You know what I mean? So like, exactly. my, For us, it's that time again. You got to find a way to get it done. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, however you do it, we're at war. The president just said stand by, stand down to stand by. To yeah. mm-hmm. We're at war. Like Some- If that tell you the signs is there... This is the last day. So it's like one of the things I wanted to do is like make sure like I wanted to keep that fight, that spirit, because that's what that night in November did for me, making that song. It was like it kickstarted just a little bit of hope, but that little bit of hope turned into everything else. Yeah, man. Into all of these things. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, my father used to say it in church, but if you have the faith of a mustard seed, that's enough. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sometimes if you just got enough faith in yourself, even when everybody else says no, over time it'll show. Because that's what's in you. That's what was born in you. That was exactly. birthing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like being able you can't to teach that. You, know, you can't teach that. Mm-mm. And over time, you learn it. But for some of us, time takes longer to teach us than others. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's, 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 that's just the facts, man. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you just have to time. Time is the is that thing that just some people just need, you know? I No matter how much I tell you something, you might not fully understand it or fully comprehend it until you're 40. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, this is some shit that, like, people say. Not me in general, but, like, just overall. Like, there's just some things, concepts that people just have to, in their own time, have to understand. Because it's just not just going to click. Um, but, yeah, man, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good one. You know, the mustard seed one. I feel like I've heard that one before. Uh, yeah, black church ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one before, man. It's been a minute, though. <laughs> um, let's keep talking about On West Enemy, man. Because there's a yeah. line in there that really, like, stood out to me. And I related to it as well. I feel I feel like I, I related to it. You say, never black enough for the hood, too educated for the white. Now, yeah. I've heard this line used in different ways, and but this one felt a little different. Explain uh, what you meant with this line. Well, so when I um, when my father got his church when I was like 13, we had to move to Abington. And so I, at that point in my life, like I was always stuck between these two worlds. But at a pivotal moment in my life, you know what I mean? So like I can go home and see my friends in, in Brockton and they're like, yo, what's up, man? But at the same time, I'm not there day in and day out. So I don't know what's going on all the time. And then over here, I don't know any of you guys because you guys have grown up with each other since six. And so <laughs> my father was trying to like get me to be like, you're going to be the only one in the room. You know, when you're in a boardroom, you're going to be the only one in the room. When you're in this, you're going to be the only one in the room. You're gonna be the-. And so like, it kind of gave me this like fighting, like this fighter atmosphere every day I went to school. Damn. You know what I mean? Where it was kind of just like, I got to fight to get my credit. Then not, not like physically, but like mentally and like yeah. the way I talk and the way that I attack. Like I had to physically keep it by any means. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And so it, it stuck with me for a long time because even in college that transcended, you know what I mean? Like I, you know, the, the brothers would be chilling in the dorm rooms or go out to a club or a bar or whatever. And I would go with him from time to time and I'd be like, yo, bro, this is a waste of my fucking time. I could be sitting at home fucking chilling or I could be at the dorm and I could have went and got some fucking 
rubbing alcohol that we used to have that um Ruben off. I could have got yeah. that dollars and saved my fucking check that I had this week. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean me I mean I would have had to get a shit ton of Hawaiian punch, but I would have made do. You know yeah, I mean? we made it work, man. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm thinking about it. And so after a while, like, I stopped that. And then, like, one of my – I had, I was always good with making friends, and I was always cool with everybody and talking with everybody and getting along with everybody. And so over time, it was like, yo, D, like, you know, my, my wife friends would be like, yo, we're going to this other school. We want to kick it? Like, I, my buddy got a place where you can crash with us. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't the same dilemma you have with black people where it's like, yo, we got to go check, we gotta go to this place, and then we're going to come back late tonight. Because mm-hmm. well, that nigga don't trust you. And he don't trust niggas in general. <laughs> Whereas it's like, I, I come with them and it's like, oh, yo, man, you're good. No worries. Like, you're a black guy with white guys. No, there's no way you'd steal. There's no fucking way. You know what I mean? Now, generally, I'm not like that anyways. Yeah. But it's just, it's the crazy dynamics of both worlds that it just seems like for years, it was just like, I was so trying to, like, figure out, like, where my place was. And especially now, you know, I, I don't feel this way, and I don't know if you feel this way, but I know a lot of brothers must feel some type of way now who grew up like that, feeling that line like we do, that are kind of like, should I over-accentuate on, like, the protest right now, or or should I try to sit back and just, you know, figure out where I am or where I stand? Because I've had this dilemma and this problem since I was 13. Yeah. Some people may not realize it's that dilemma until you're 36 and it hits you this year, or yes. 24 and it hits you this year, mm-hmm. or 75 and it hits you. You know what I'm saying? You don't know where everybody is at different stages in their life when they get awakened. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's different when you see how that rolls. And so for me, like, that's what I mean. It's just like, it seems like you're trying to fit a perception on one side and defy a perception on another. And really you just want to be fucking happy and just yeah. live your fucking life and be you and be mm-hmm. happy with being you. And I think that's what I realized with this album was like, I'm perfectly fine being the middle. I don't, I'm not a fence. I, I look at myself as a bridge. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, over here and I can be like, yo, fellas, what you guys don't understand about my community is this. And I can give examples X, Y, and Z to educate them because I know that they're genuinely allies. They just don't fucking know. Mm-hmm. But it's over here, I got to sit there and be like, yo, try to educate more on like, yo, how's your credit score? How's your business? What have you been looking forward to doing for yourself? Are you looking at having another business, a storefront? Like most of the time when I go out everywhere, even if it's just like the shirt, one shirt or not, I'm wearing my shit. It don't even matter. Yeah. <laughs> ask me, what shit is that? I'm going to wear it because then if somebody goes like, oh, that's a nice fucking rose. Oh, that's his logo. Oh, shit. Yeah, uh, let me look a little closer. <laughs> yeah. Business all the time. And so that's kind of where I got with that. But I also got to a point where I'm like, yo, like, there's days where I'm okay with just sitting at home and just watching the office for like four hours. And I don't give a fuck what black person cares about it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I'll sit and watch curb your enthusiasm and fucking laugh or how I met your mother and enjoy myself because that's what I grew up enjoying watching. That's what I like to do. Yeah. And the stigma of how black you're supposed to be and how black enough we are and stuff like that. First of all, the, the president's trying to kill us y'all. Can we cut that shit out? At yeah. Least- <laughs> we need to cut that shit out. Right. The fuck. We, we that at least until this nigga's gone. Yeah. Then we go back to having this light skin, dark skin matchup. I'm all for it. Right. Yeah. This nigga until this <laughs> But at some point, you know what I mean? Like, at some point, we got to get over that shit because there's bigger things that we got to talk about. We got to hit. We got to work about building that black dollar back, building our communities back, Mm -hmm. building each other up, making sure that when we have podcast shit like that and we want to talk about issues like this, we reach out to brothers that are doing shit in the community instead of going to some fucking white person and being like, yo, please listen to my story because I think it's so powerful. No. Go to your own community. Support that power. And for us, the black dollar is the black social media. That's yes. what we got to pour and invest ourselves into and invest in each other in because that's mm-hmm. how we stay aware. That's how we stay self-noticed. And that's how we all get information now. Yeah, man. I mean, look at black Twitter. Black Twitter is Twitter. You know, they say black Twitter, but that really is Twitter. It is Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> like, I hate when people do that. It's like, like all these dances that are popping off of TikTok, it comes from black people like like I, time. Yeah, I just got hit to talk to i feel like such an old man my sister put me on to it she's in college she was like you know about tiktok i'm like yeah i heard about it here and there she's like what what do you mean heard about it here and there i'm like the thing with the videos with the t on the top with the cursive like i do my t she's like oh Lord, jesus like, yeah it's like that's there that, yeah, like, that's a whole new world of tiktok man but it, you know for me it's like it's funny because i know so many comedic friends and i know people like this and stuff i'm working on for the podcast for minority news coming up it's like yo all right cool i but if i didn't know 
you would never understand. And I feel like a lot of times that's where people like me and you come in where it's like, yo, I didn't know a black person could really be down with his culture, but also be well-rounded and versed where he can understand where I'm coming from and bridge the gap for me. You know what I mean? Like just because you don't see it every day doesn't mean it don't exist. Nah, for sure, man. And you know, I, I, you know, a line like that, man, you know, I grew up, getting called Oreo, you know, black, right. Right. black outside, white on the inside, you know, just cause I played the guitar. Cause I liked rock music and I didn't just like hip hop. Cause I didn't say nigga. I would say, dude, you know what I mean? Like these are the yeah. things, like these were things I grew up with and everything the same. I, everything you said, I dealt with it the same exact oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, with a line that deep and intellectual, I knew you did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, I ain't nice on the guitar like that. I don't, I got the voice and that's it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it's like, you know, the fact that like I had a talent that is more associated with white people and that makes me white. It's like, what do you mean? First of all, now it's like, first of all, if we go way back now, like you can, you can say this is, you know, more black people shit, but let's not do that. But like, really, you're going to like pull that car to me just because I like, you know, I don't just listen to hip hop, you know, and, and and those are the things that, you know, when it comes to race in this country, like we have so much to work on, man. There's so much we have to get done. And that's why empowering like other black people, you know, that's why Wale says, sue me. I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Like, like yeah. if, if you're white and you don't understand that, well, shit, you might never understand that because this shit is deep. It's rooted so hard. Like, you know, and, I, I, and that's just something I just wanted to get out there because, you know, you have, you know, minority news network, you know, like it's called minority news for a reason because, you know, right. we need to empower each other. But um, what's the future plans for minority news network? The future plans is for Shadi and the music. What, what, um, what do you see everything? everything going from here man well um we're definitely gonna be uh we have a video we have like a web video series that's coming with the album two of them we have kind of like the music video kind of netflix style series that we're gonna have connected with the album so you'll have kind of like this film that goes with the album that kind of encapsulates everything that goes on and talks about in the album um then we're gonna have uh, i am Sh- my name is shoddy um which is gonna be our docuseries that we're gonna release on instagram uh probably by the end of this month starting with that um and then minority news um we're gonna switch over a little bit so beyond the sheets is actually gonna go to wiz beloved uh it's no longer gonna be a part of my thing um and i'm gonna do a segment called artist to artist um, okay. where I do one, and i talk with artists every other tuesday and just kind of be like hey listen like but it's not like the interview how you guys do i'm gonna be like yo what don't you like about right now <laughs> in this city? What the fuck don't you like? Yeah. What you are? Because you know what? Like behind closed doors, we have these conversations and I'm going to leave them behind conversations. But it's like a sure. lot of niggas right now want to have like these vent sessions, but nobody is like ready to do it because it's like, oh, we don't want the media in Boston to get behind. So I'm like, yo, after I, I saw, that. I can't even front after like, because we were thinking about doing different segments for the Minority News Network for a while, for the last couple of months. And then when I saw those awards come out, I was like, first of all, I'm okay with it because I didn't produce anything this year up until September 27th. So yeah. <laughs> what am I supposed to be in here for? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, my, that's my just natural, like, common response mm-hmm. to that. And then two is like, there's a lot of people on here that was well-deserving that I know of firsthand that are from here. But then y'all got people like Bia and Stiz who ain't lived here in like four or five years. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The damn ticket. And then you got, and you wonder why niggas is getting upset and blowing their spots on Instagram and social media and all this shit and starting fights and all. And I'm like, nah, we just need one night every other week just to air this shit out and air grievances. And yeah. just be like, I'm sick of this shit. And just be like, what I'm sick of. Because I was having a great conversation with a photographer friend who works in the industry as well today. And she agreed with me. Like, it was like, yo. I told it straight up. I'm like, it's really hard for me to like promote or com- or to put anything out and really push it in Boston because, and I didn't like, and I, like I told her, I'm like, I want you to know that like I'm in full support and I don't want you to take this the wrong way. Boston don't want to hear anything about a brother right now. It's all about women. It's all about black women and music. They don't, they're not trying to give us this whole, like, it's like, man, yo, brother, that's, right. <laughs> that's cool. But I like what she's doing. I like this. And so, like, you it's got true, people man. that are like, yo, what the fuck is up with that? But mind you, I've known Sham and Brandy for years. They're like sisters to me. And they're nice. So, they're really good. They're so really for good. For me, this is well-deserved. And they, they deserve, deserve it. Of course. You know what I'm saying? Whereas you Not got niggas now that are like, what the fuck? This, that, and the third. But I also understand both sides. There's 
well-deserved for the work you've put in and the time and the effort you've put in. Like my homie, like my other queen, Oompa, because she's mm-hmm. fucking dawn. Oompa's Cleo album inspired me to really go with the narrative for 27 Club. I want to point that out. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> you fucking shit. You the fucking shit. Um, she go hard. No, she go hard too, man. No, but my thing is, is like, for every guy that's sitting here talking about that, you got to think about how many years these girls were on stages getting ostracized for their body and not even a record. And the record was hard, but they don't even give a fuck about the record because they just, just want mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they're not even looking at that. They didn't hear a word. They didn't hear a word, yeah. yeah. And I get that, but at the same time, like, if you're an artist who's busting his ass and you're trying to make things come out of the city and you want local, you know, attention and awareness to your shit, it's kind of hard when they're doing what LA's already going to do to you but when you move there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is essentially like, are you sexy enough? Are you good enough? Does your sound hit hard enough? Or can I get her instead and then tell her that I can make all this stuff happen? Because if you sign a woman to a contract, she's emotionally more stable for her to deal with it. So she'll take more shit and make more records. Mm-hmm. Now, this sounds fucked up, but this is how record labels think. I know, man. That's what I'm saying. Like, people don't understand <laughs> the real. links and the just like just the, the like, dirty like, valleys people will go to do this shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it's like, you, it's like you can put it on to like the, the white rapper. Like, these, like these, are, these, these labels know that, okay, the majority of this country is white. We don't care this is a black genre. We don't care about the culture at all. This is a white rapper. <laughs> white people are going to like him because he's the same skin color. And we're going to promote the shit out of it. We don't care about culture, <laughs> ethics, none of that. Boom. Jack Harlow. You know what I mean? Oh, I love Jack Harlow. Don't get me wrong. But that is Jack Harlow. That is a That, that was just like, damn, on the money. Like, yeah. damn. <laughs> I couldn't even say it better than that. That was fucking... Yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, this is, you know, I, you know, I can, I'll say it, man, with me and you, like, I can tell you have an understanding of the music industry. It's like, yeah. don't you? Ever, I'll ask this question because I almost wrap it up. Do you, you ever feel like you could like whistle blow the rap game and just like kind of <laughs> mess things up in a way? You almost feel like you have to bite your tongue. There was a couple of things that like, there was. A, so we're gonna do a deluxe version of the album, by the way. That's gonna happen. Okay. And make the cut, but. There's a couple songs that like I do kind of get into that. Like I, I do get a little bit into that cuz it's just kind of like yo like how one it's just wild to me. Here's the number one thing that's wild to me. It doesn't even have to be with the industry right now. Mm-hmm. But it does have a major part of the industry if you're an artist who wants to build with the industry. Yes. Artist. The manager works for you. You do not work for the fucking manager. Yeah. <laughs> business is business, man. Well, you know? so here you go. Here's here. So I'll give you a perfect example, right? I'm mm-hmm. working on the album. There was a song that didn't make the album that I really wanted in the album. The person who produced the album, phenomenal talent, wonderful person. However, they asked for final cuts to my song. Their DJ, their their manager to approve my album if it fit with it. I'm like. Like what? Hell no! <laughs> what is this? Like, <laughs> what? Like, but it goes to show, like, the politics of it. Even here in Boston, I was like, "Yo, I under and like for me, my whole thing is understanding time and place." Yeah. If this was maybe three years from now, and God willing, I'm in a very more successful place, and I'm flying out to LA, and you ask for all these things, and your list goes a hundred more than how many more records that I got. You know what? I'm going to sit and see if we can compromise. Yeah. However, nigga, if you in the same state as me, you ain't moving, and you might be a little bit better off on social media <laughs> than I am. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to go out of my way, especially because what I was concerned was is, is if he tampered with it, you wouldn't get this message. That mm. was my biggest thing. I'm like, yo, like, you can't, you, I'm like, you got, and I kept trying to stress, I'm like, you got to understand, you cannot fuck with this. Like, whatever you say, I'm not going to fucking listen. Yeah. I know what I'm doing with this. Mm-hmm. So it, it didn't You're work not going to change my mind. And I, I hope to work with this person again. But it was just to the point, it was like, yo, the message was so important for me with this that I could care less how good, uh, how, how much the greatness of the music was in it. So it was like, I just wanted the message to be cohesive. But just to go back to that business thing, yeah, bro, there's so many records I have that I'm like, yo, boy, talking a lot of shit, but you ain't got it. Yeah. What? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we could go and do that, but the problem is, is then one, you're classified as a hater, and then you get Wale. Mm-hmm. 
Which yeah, is that's the other part. When Wale talks his mind and speaks the truth, and someone puts him on air, it takes another three years for the nigga to get back on because he's, he's like, looked at too angry. Fuck yeah, this, fuck that. And then you're like, well, now you got to realize it's a professional balance scale, and now you got to kind of like work the equilibrium. You know, mm-hmm. this sucks, but it's true. Now and you have to remember, like certain fans don't give a damn either. So like, <laughs> you have lot, you know, lifelong fans who don't give a shit about the music industry part of things. They just no, want no, music. They, they'd be like, yo, he cussed out the industry. Fuck yeah, dude, that's my no. I'm gonna yeah. that nigga right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like, it's just. It's just, it's just weird how like people react to like, you know, how like, you know, how the music industry just does certain things. And, you know, and that's why I asked you just about the whole like, you know, whistleblowing thing, because it's just like, you know, we you know, we have learned so much about the music industry and we want to say all about it, too. But we don't want to come off like, you know, too yeah, crazy you or too you mad. Wanna, you don't want to be the one to blow the whistle, because the thing is, is we're talking about it. And what we're talking about is giving like an eye-opening experience. But the sad part that I, I think that like, as we keep talking about this is, is I think they've already understood that it's blown. The whistle yeah. blown and niggas just don't give a fuck. And it's exactly. just like, damn. I'm like, we're really at that point. And that's kind of the sad part. Yeah. We're at that point in hip hop. Now the whistle has been blown, but it's like, who cares? <laughs> if we don't, we, we want to go back to it for real, for real. Yeah. The whistle got blown. If you're reading this, it's too late. Mm. Oh, when Miller shit happened. That's what I knew. Niggas didn't give a fuck no more. Yeah, facts. Too big to fail because mm-hmm. half of that album, you can go on Quentin Miller's SoundCloud at the time and hear the samples and hear the reference track. Mm-hmm. It was all there. And so it was like, oh. And then once they were like, "I love Dre," oh my god, Dre came out with new shit. It's like, yo, they don't care. They mm-hmm. like, they don't care. And that, and I think that was like probably like the scariest thing because that's when we got that was like, a cherry on top. Oh, that was when we got way too comfortable because they knew for a fact, and we knew, especially if we, you know the business, they not giving this nigga up. No. <laughs> a light-skinned Jewish boy that has no tattoos on the front of his face or like that, that can sell to people, to both markets? Mm-hmm. You think they're going to give that up? You crazy. Yeah. You it's crazy. Not, not a chance, yo. Drake's on his way to literally becoming, like, the greatest artist of all time. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Essentially, a lot, I'm going I'm to I'm compare it this way. Mm-hmm. What Drake is to the rap game right now and to the game of the world is what Tiger Woods was for the early 2000s. Damn. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, man. That's a real good way Wherever to put it. Wherever he goes, you can't do fucking wrong. And even if he does do wrong, mm-hmm. Nike sponsored the affair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was 15 commercials. <laughs> Literally. <yeah. laughs> like, yo, and that's when I was like, yo, this nigga's the Tiger Woods at the end of, it, of, of the rap game. Like, mm-hmm. Don't care if you like him on the black side. Don't care if you like him on the white side. Nigga still got a tent with 40 bitches waiting for him and telling you to go suck my dick. Like, I don't want the biggest house. Like, just Mm -hmm. doesn't change anything. And like, it sucks because you want to whistleblow and you want to be creative about it. But then you also like from a business standpoint, it's like, how good is it going to do you to whistleblow? Yeah. Because what if you do blow off this and then it's like, oh, yeah, I want to get in the industry. And niggas are like, no, nigga. You yeah, you said, yeah, you said all this shit about who? <laughs> hey, yo, people in the industry are smart. They can pick up more subliminals than people give them credit for. Exactly, man. Right. They're they're in it too. They get it like they get it like us, man. They're they're not, you know, you got you can't take them for the idiots, like like or not the idiots, but you know what I mean. Like the ones that won't understand it. The companies, because they know it on a level. Higher than we do. Mm-hmm. Nah, man. Yeah, that's just the truth of it all, man. But um, yeah, man, we're cu- we're cutting it close to the time, so I want to definitely wrap it up where we are right now, though, man. But um, this was a really dope conversation, man. I feel like there was a lot that we discussed, a lot that we broke down, man. Um, and I'm really happy to have you on the show. Um, is there anything that you wanted to plug before we get out of here? Um, just you know, again, like we talked about, whether mental health awareness, whether you're a black man feeling like you're in a white world and you can't figure out the two. I hope that, you know, whether you listen to the album or you not listen to the album, that you understand that you're, you're perfect just the way you are. And it's better to just learn how to appreciate and evolve the person on the inside because everything else will come around you. What you grow on the inside, what you grow on the inside for good nurture will come back to you tenfold. Mm, I like that, man. We'll definitely end it on this note. Shadi, thank you for being on this episode of Tempest on Podcast, man. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure, brother. Thank you for having me. I thank you so much. No problem, man. Ladies and gentlemen, that's episode 79. Make sure you tune in again for another one. We're coming at you another one this week, all right? Thank you for tuning in. Peace.